Hello, everyone. Hello, welcome to Archie Julia. My name is Jackie, and I am your best friend this evening. I have the pleasure of introducing our lovely guest. Janet Wallace is the author of 10 books, including Deborah Queen, The Extraordinary Life of Your Tree Bell, which has been translated into 12 languages and was a New York Times notable book. We are thrilled to have her here to celebrate her newest novel, Flirting with Danger, described as a compelling story that pulsates with the energy of a thriller. We will have time for a Q&A at the end, so if you haven't had, um, and we'll also have a signing line, sorry. So if you haven't had a chance to get your copy yet, we have them available at the registers um, across the way, and then we'll be hosting the signing line in the back of the room. So without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to Janet. Enjoy. Mm -hmm. Nice to see you all. Beautiful. Yes. Um, people sometimes ask me, what's the relationship like between a spy and the government that, that you should work for? And I think about Somerset Maugham who was a spy for the British during World War I and wrote a, a novel called Ashton about a man who applies for a job as a spy with the British government. <laughs> and when he has his interview, the interviewer says to him, if you get this job and you do it well, you will get no thanks. <laughs> if you get this job and you get in trouble, you will get no thanks. <laughs> and that makes me think of Marguerite Harrison, who um, was a real person. This is a nonfiction book, and it's her story. Uh, people ask me also, how did you find out about her? And that's kind of fun because it was in 1993 mm -hmm. and I was doing research about Gertrude Bell at the University of Newcastle in England where her papers were. And I came across a letter and she wrote thousands of letters and kept diaries all the time. So there were stacks of them. But I came across one letter Written in 1924 from Iraq, where she was the one of the top British officials, and actually the most important person in the creation of modern Iraq after World War I. She wrote home to her father saying that an extraordinary American woman had come through town and that she had invited her for dinner and she was so fascinating that she had everyone in her all. And she said she had never had such an uproarious dinner before. And I thought, what was an American woman doing in Baghdad in 1924? All I could think was she must have been a spy. <laughs> And I she gave her name, Marguerite Harrison, and I tried to find out about her, but not very much because I was deep into the biography of the well, Desert Queen. And, but when I finished that book and it, after it came out, I was still thinking about Marguerite Harrison. I could find nothing about her. I, I wrote another book, this one about a French, a young French woman, this true story, taken into the Sultan's harem in the late 18th century, who rose to become the mother of a sultan and the wife of a sultan. I finished that book and I thought about Marguerite Harrison. <laughs> I, I wrote a book about Coco Chanel, much easier to find. <laughs> Nothing about Marguerite. I wrote one more about Hetty Green, who was the richest woman in America. Um, and when she died in 1916, she left $100 million to the financial team, which mm -hmm. made this money mostly on that. Mm -hmm. Okay, Marguerite could hide for so long, and I was determined to find it. 
I filed a FOIA request. I don't know if any of you ever have, but he did a first reading of the years. I waited and waited and waited for an answer. And I did get one, and they said that there were papers of hers at the National Archives in Washington. And I went down there and I filled out, I don't know how many forms, and spent, I don't know how many hours, days, weeks, going through hundreds and hundreds of files of military intelligence. And they were fascinating. But some were written by her, some were written by other in intelligence around the world. And she was clearly a, a woman who took great risks, who was often in danger, and who had tremendous courage. Uh, I found her absolutely fascinating. Um, I also discovered that she was uh, not only a spy, but a, report, a writer and reporter. And um, she wrote for the Baltimore Sun. She wrote for 18, for New York Post, and the New York Times. And when I was going through her articles, I found one in the New York Times magazine about her meeting with Gertrude Bell. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I thought that was absolutely fascinating. And um, what was so interesting about them, I think, is that they were two daughters of the Gilded Age, signs of prominent families with gobs of money and generations of good lineage. Physically similar at five foot six with auburn hair and blue gray eyes, the British woman's piercing, the American sparkling, each had a shapely figure, stiff spine, and self-assured bearing. I don't want to sit on screen. <laughs> Each was highly intelligent, fluent in at least five languages. Well-educated with an interest in world affairs, a strong knowledge of European literature, and appreciation of the arts. Each loved writing, hiking, and flowers, and each had a passion for stylish clothes. Miss Bell was a worthy diplomat, Mrs. Harrison, a worthwhile reporter, who had recently interviewed Mustafa Kamal, soon to be known as Ataturk, the new ruler of the new Turkish Republic. I am having a different Miss Bell announced, you must come to my house. There will be a handful of guests, all of them men, and each of them important. And the good conversation will go on late into the night. Mrs. Harrison held them all under her spell. Like Scheherazade, she beguiled them with her tales of her adventures. There would be more tales, more adventures to come. But much of her mystery would remain just that, secrets of the spy. Uh, she was an unlikely spy. She was born in 1868, which was not long after the Civil War. Her father had created a commercial shipping company called Transatlantic Lines. So they did business in Europe and the family went with him every summer to Europe. Her mother was a socialite with great ambitions that her daughter would marry a man of wealth and like her own, their own family and title because that was a very good thing at the time. Marguerite was a rebel. So she had a a serious flirtation with a Turkish bay, which her mother did not like. <laughs> and she did see a man her mother wished she would marry. He was very dull in her condition. And when they went out dancing, he stepped on her toes. Even though his name was Winston Churchill. <laughs> <laughs> 
was married with a man that she fell wildly in love with back in Maryland. They were Baltimore family. And uh, he was charming, but had no money. They were married in one of the most lavish weddings that they had ever seen in Maryland. Her mother was furious because he was not a man. But nevertheless, it would be a good brother. And in by 1902, they had their, their good marriage, a son, and she was a proper citizen, interested in, well, there were ladies' lunches and charity dinners and beautiful clothes and um, the life of a, a social life. But in 1915, he died suddenly. And she was left a widow at the age of 37 mm -hmm. without money. And so instead of going home to her family, which is what her life I usually did, she was a rebel. So she went to the Baltimore Sun and found a job as an assistant and rose in that job to become a, a uh, cultural uh, critic. And then when World War I broke out, she became a reporter. First domestically, but then she wanted to go to the front. Naturally, that's where the action was in the adventure. No women were allowed at the front. She decided to become a spy, if you could, and she applied for a job with naval intelligence because the Navy had had an intelligence division for a long time. Well, they saw that she was um, Mrs. Harrison, Marguerite, a woman, and the immediate answer was, no, we do not hire women. So she went to the Army, and they were just starting up an intelligence division. And the army sent a man to interview her, kind of like after me. Um, and they knew that, well, she had said that she spoke languages well. And so they sent somebody who interviewed her partly in German. Her German was so good that he asked her how long she had lived in Germany, because remember, these were our enemies. And she said, I've never lived in Germany, and I'm an eighth generation American. Mm -hmm. And she said, I speak French just as well as I speak German, and Spanish and Italian almost as well. When the head of military intelligence heard about her, read the report about her, he was taken and said, absolutely, we want her. His name, by the way, was wonderful, too. It was Marlborough Churchill. <laughs> <laughs> so she was hired. And just as she was gathering her bows and papers and putting everything in order, uh, the Germans asked for an armistice. And she thought, well, that's the end of that job. It was a nice idea while it lasted. But in fact, the United States knew nothing about what was happening inside Germany. We had plenty of people at the front in France and in Belgium, but there had been no fighting, no war in Germany. And so we hadn't had people there. And we needed to know the political, the uh, economic, the social, and the psychological conditions in Germany. After all, we were going to sign a treaty. We had demands that we needed to make, wanted to make, reparations that needed to be uh, discussed. But you have to know what's going on before you can do that. And so Marguerite was sent off to Germany uh, at the end of 1918, beginning of 1919. And 
it was her job to assess their the strengths and analyze their the ideas and report back, of course, to military intelligence. And she carried a list of contacts with her and letters of introduction. And one of them was to Nina Bryce Turnbull, a Philadelphia socialite who had married an aristocratic German officer. The well-respected general, Hans von Bülow, had led 14 divisions against the Allies on the Western Front. She joined the couple for tea and cakes and found the taste more bitter than sweet. The white-mustached Prussian general, bullet-headed and thickly built, greeted her with a stiff bow and a cold shiver. She stayed silent while the general addressed her with contempt acknowledging the Americans weaponry, but berating the incompetence of the American men, especially at the Argonne. She listened while the, cup, the tea in her cup went cold. His wife, the American Frau von Bülow, was more condescending than her German husband, <laughs> angrily, scorning President Wilson for joining the Allies and scoffing at the notion that the Germans had lost the war. <laughs> but Marguerite was polite and listened and friendly and her politesse paid off. A few days later, she was invited for dinner. The group that gathered at the Van Bureaus looked as stylish as any at a smart Parisian dinner. Ladies shimmering in silk evening dresses, jewels sparkling on their ears and their arms and around their necks. The men, starched and polished, standing stiff and straight, their hair glistening with pomade, their mustaches waxed and combed to a point. The dinner table glowed, the conversation was lively, they were all former officers and their wives from the German army, and they swore their fealty to the monarchy. Marguerite listened and spoke politely and sipped her German champagne. She nodded, she smiled, she laughed in all the right places, and she took mental notes for much later. Between the bites, the guests sprinkled spice on their meal, peppering the conversation with anti-Semitic remarks. The Jews, they insisted, were to blame for everything. They were the leaders of Marxist thinking. They had profited from the war. They had caused problems for the economy. And they were behind the new government. Marguerite listened. It was important for her to befriend these people, but she boiled inside. Mm -hmm. Like a chameleon, on the nights and the evenings when she wasn't with the monarchists, <clears throat> she was meeting with the socialists and befriended them. But their tactics were no less militant, their defiance no more moderate, than the angry nationalists. Later, she passed on the information she gathered from both sides and dropped off her reports to MI. Her drop off point was the Adlon, an imposing hotel with an impressive roof located on the Unter der Linden near the British, the French, and the Russian embassies. Spies, counter spies, and agents were thick as peas in Germany, she wrote, and the Adlon was their most important part. Well, she spent uh, all of her time learning about these groups. Not all of her time, I shouldn't say that, because she was also looking at the economy. She was studying the political situation. She saw the first uh, election in Germany where women were allowed to vote. 
<clears throat> before women voted in this country, uh, which was really interesting, and it drew a big turn. Um, she belonged to the secret societies of the right wing and reported on them. She saw in 1919, in 1920, she saw right wing groups with that that had placards and posters against the Jews and members of these groups marching in the streets. Ex army and ex army people in their uniforms, young boys in belted jackets and matching caps with high black boots. Neck stretched high, knees pointed high, marching on their way they believed to stomp out the Jews. This was the beginning of the Nazi movement in Germany, 1919-1920. She learned of generals' plots to ignore the, the agreements that were being made with the Americans to install a democratic government. They were going to take over Prussia and Lithuania and the East, Eastern Europe and set up nationalist, anti-American, of course, um, sovereign states. She also learned about the left wing, the socialists, who were trying to uh, infiltrate the United States with communist propaganda. And she reported all of this back to Washington. When she came back to Washington after the Versailles Peace Treaty, she found that the Americans were also turning inward, <laughs> nationalist, and that there was, of course, uh, prohibition, and there was also an outward hostility, or hostility looking outward, towards foreign countries and towards immigrants coming into this country. And she was so disgusted, she wanted to go back to the Europe. She was, she won high praise for her work. And she was wanted by, um, uh, Marlboro Churchill wanted her to go to Mexico. The head of counterintelligence wanted her to go to Japan. And uh, the head of intelligence in Europe wanted her to be there and to work around the continent in uh, all contiguous capitals. But she was watching the Bolshevik Re Revolution, and she was very interested in it because she wondered about its impact not only in Russia, but around the world. How, what would happen? Would would there? What kind of effect would this have on 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 all societies? And so she convinced Marlboro Churchill to send her to Russia, and she wasn't able to get there with permission, but she decided to travel there anyway, and she. Um, she she wrapped a thousand dollars in gold coins around her waist. She had a uh, code book, of course, in her bag, and she had a uh, a uh, the, the name of Agent B in her message. <laughs> uh, and she set off for for Russia, stopping first in England, where she where she got credentials to represent the AP in Moscow, which was a very extremely important, as it still is an extremely important news organization. She traveled across Europe, wound up in Poland, where she had to stop because there were terrible uh, occurrences in Russia at the time. And she was told not to travel to Russia at that point. So she stayed in Poland, learned Polish, and then and then went to the Polish border. At the border, 
a nervous Polish lieutenant. And I have to say that Poland and Russia, even though there had been an armistice with the Allies, Poland and Russia were still at war, fighting over borders. A nervous Polish lieutenant led her through a maze of barbed wire fence, trying hard to dissuade her and warning her that she would be shot at once if she stepped onto Russian turf. She shrugged in defiance, and standing at the edge of the unknown, she headed off toward the eerie passage of no man's land. Against a bitter wind and temperatures well below zero, she wrapped her doubts in her long fur coat, and with her fur cap on her head and her fur-lined gloves warming her hands, she trudged in her felt boots through the deadly silence, crunching over miles of snow-blanketed fields. Like Tolstoy's Prince Andre, she knew that one step beyond that line lay the unknown. And what was there? Who was there? Beyond this field, no one knew. She would like to know, was afraid to know, wanted so much to cross it. Sooner or later, she would have to cross it. She was aware that once she reached the Russian side, she would have no one to turn to for help. No American diplomats had stayed in the country. No foreign embassies and no one she knew to receive a message if she were inside and no one when she was to, to and no way to send a message out. She would be at the mercy of a dangerous adversary. In Moscow, she met Lenin and she interviewed Trotsky. He was friendly with um, uh, Mayakovsky, the famed Russian poet, and with Alexandra Tolstoya, the daughter of the, the, the writer. He was friends with John Reed and his wife, Louise Bryan, and with the anarchists Emma Goldman and Alexander Berkman. It's quite a group. <laughs> He also wound up in Lubyanka prison and was there for almost a year, where she developed tuberculosis and lost a lung. <laughs> Nevertheless, she chain smoked her whole life. <laughs> <laughs> she went on from Russia to the Far East. She was in Japan, where they asked her to spy on the Chinese. She was in China where they asked her to spy on the Russians. <laughs> and all the time, the US had her spying on the Japanese, the Chinese, and the Russians. Uh, and when she died, she was 89 years old. Oh, I should say, I'm sorry, before she died, she went to Persia and she climbed the highest mountains in Persia, making a landmark documentary, which was a silent film. <laughs> so she she died in, in 1967 at the age of 89. She had lived quite a life. And she took some of her secrets with her as all spies do. <laughs> That's a summary, a brief <laughs> summary of Marguerite Harrison. Um, and I hope you have some questions because I'd love to answer them. Yes. When did she actually stop the spying part of her life? Around 1926. Um, <laughs> however, she continued to travel and one never knows. Especially because she lived through World War II. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. Yeah. And there yeah. were no papers, but. Um, it's very possible. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. Did, did she come back to the U.S. Uh, before she died, or did she, she did stay in Europe? And... She did come back to the U.S. when World War II did, in 1935. She wrote an autobiography in 1935 with the with the dateline of um, Morocco, mm -hmm. and then she came back to the U.S. But she she lived in Europe for a long time. She she had a Jack Poe in France, which was unfortunately. I thought that was going to be the highlight of my right, <laughs> <laughs> but it was bomb and yeah. mm -hmm. yes. You mentioned some names in there, Von Bulo. Yes, is that relation to no, no, no. 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 this is Van Van Bulo. Okay, the, yeah, and then Churchill is that relation to Winston Churchill? Yeah, I, somehow they were very distant. Yeah, you know. and the third question I had, and final question. Any difference between British spies and American spies, women? I know spies are spies, but are there any differences? I don't know. I forgot to say that she was the only American woman who was sent overseas at that time. Mm -hmm. So um, she's the only one you compare with. I think those who did spy generally came from well-educated, came from wealthy families. It was the same with the men. Intelligence yes. was made up of Harvard and Yale and, and so on. Marguerite actually went to Radcliffe for about five minutes. She fell in love with the <laughs> <laughs> well, she fell in love with the landlady's son. And her mother found that and dragged her off. <laughs> you said she um, had journals, a diary type things. Did you actually get to read any of her writing? Um, it was Gertrude Bell who had the diary. Oh, the Gertrude Bell. Oh. Marguerite probably had letters, and she may have had diaries, but her daughter-in-law, the second wife of her son, destroyed all the papers. Oh, oh. Uh, for a biographer, I can't tell you how frustrated. Oh, yeah. uh, it says something about her family life. Yes, yes. yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Along the lines of uh, papers, it's just fascinating how you were able to research yes. all of this. Mm -hmm. It's just amazing. And how do you think going on in the future without the letters and the journals that people are not in the habit of doing? How do you think that will change telling well, history? Uh, yeah, it's a good question. Um, how, how, how will that change without the letters in the yeah. um, I think it's going to be a nightmare reading all those emails. Yeah. And there'll be deleted ones, and you can actually, I think, dig out the deleted ones. It's going to be a lot of work. <laughs> But it's so exciting when you yeah. find this, you know, it can be just this tiny little piece of information that, that just is somehow telling about other things or enriches the, you know, the person you're writing about. Right. Yeah. I know Marguerite Harrison bubbled up when you were working on Gertrude Bell. And when I look at your other books, there's a lot of strong women that you're that you're writing about. How do you generally choose your subjects? Well, I do look for strong um, independent women who have made some kind of an impact on the, on, on the world. Mm -hmm. um, positive on the world. I think that's important. Uh, and, and I do like that period from between between the wars, particularly. I think it's or from 1900 to uh, I think it's just a fascinating period. And I learned so much about World War I writing this and, and how hugely impactful it was um, and still is on, our, on the world today. Do you have another woman you're working on now? I have some ideas. So. <laughs> I've been so, you know, involved in this book, but yeah, and it takes a long time. And I, I've got, I have files of people that I have spent a year, two years, sometimes more, um, trying to you know, dig out um, information about. And in the end, there just wasn't enough to write about. But you, you have to try, and you have to. Do the digging before you can come, before you can help. 
Okay, so before you did the freedom of information to get information about her, did, did any, did you find that any American group like the army acknowledged her or did you just have to go in and find the papers? I have to find the papers. She was because never, she was because never, they never involved, so. yeah. You mentioned it, was it the foyer application? Freedom of, oh, freedom, freedom of information, information. okay. Which I had never done before. Mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. It's fantastic what you can find out. There, there were, there had been a chapter in the book about four women who, um, and, and Marguerite was one of them. They actually, because women were, were not generally acknowledged for their work, and they were all explorers of one kind or another. Um, Marguerite was one, and it's one from South, who traveled in South America, another in Asia, I don't know where, the, where she was. But they were not recognized for fantastic work that they did. And so they started the Women Geographical Society. And um, it's still around. And it had members like Marguerite Mead and Eleanor Roosevelt and very important people. So, so I did read that and I discovered a dissertation, a PhD dissertation of, uh, that somebody had done about her. Mm -hmm. so, so how did she, how did, you said she went there broke, basically. How did she finance herself through all this and end up well, with the show? She was she paid. She was paid. up with the show. She had the cover of, of, of a reporter. She was yeah. a reporter. Yeah. So she actually had. It just staff. seems that she wouldn't end up in a chateau. <laughs> uh, right. Well, she wrote She wrote five books. Oh, did she? Yeah. Did oh, she inherit money? But she they, were, they were very serious books. They were, she had, she was very interested in world affairs and um, the relationships between uh, systems in different countries. Mm -hmm. So she did have income from that. And her family had money, but it was all tied up in trust. So she received some of that money much later. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It was interesting that she ended up in prison, and I maybe have to read the story oh, to, to know. <laughs> but uh, also having surgery in Russia, it sounds like oh, yeah. it must have been quite wow. hard. Yeah. 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 In the prison, I'm sure. In the prison, I yeah. how how she was released also. I <laughs> you mentioned uh, her association with John Reed. Yes. And I always think of that as like a bohemian. He was more part of the jazz and the bohemian and the poetry thing. Her being a socialite. How did she cross over into that kind of you a know, venue? That, or is it because they're writers? One of the interesting things about her, what, you know, what made what qualified her to be a spy? And one of the things was that she was very comfortable with people from all sorts of backgrounds. So she was perfectly at ease when she was invited to tea by the Japanese emperor. Mm. Okay. But she could also have a beer at a bar with a bunch of uh, mm. shipbuilders, shipbuilding you know, workers, mm. where she actually worked. Before the U.S. joined the war, because um, the American government wanted people to know that if their men went off to war, their their jobs, would, their families would still be able to eat and live normally, because women could work in jobs just as well as men would. And so Marguerite did a whole series for the Holy Ghost Son on taking on these kind of jobs. She worked. Mm -hmm. She worked in a strip building plan. She worked with a streetcar conductor. Um, mm -hmm. She did all kinds of things. Mm -hmm. And then mm -hmm. mm -hmm. So that was, and then she was, for her qualification, she was fluent in five languages when she set off. 
and she learned Russian and she learned yeah. 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 It's probably what made it so hard for her to understand the national work. Exactly. Yeah. Yes. She had yeah. such a good yeah. 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 You're a very good storyteller. Well, it's a good story. It's a very good story. You're very good at telling it. Do you read it also? Can you get it on audio? And just... You can. I don't read it, but oh, you know, somebody yeah. much better than I am is even does it on audio. Yeah. Not, yeah. yeah. Well, I loved your desert queen. Oh, it thank was. You. It was wonderful. And if she she was lovely than life, I can't imagine what this lady was <laughs> who took over the room. I mean, yeah. exactly. And Gertrude Bell had no patience for other women. So mm -hmm. for her to say that Marguerite House and Love Extraordinary really to mm -hmm. me that would have wow. Mm -hmm. I have a question. This this book and the Hetty Green book. So well researched and really tons of information and detail, kind of densely packed. But this book really reads almost like a novel. And I'm curious, I'm curious if you would ever, if you have or if you ever consider writing fiction as well. Well, I tried once. The book about the French woman and the harem. Mm -hmm. It started out, it was a suggestion, it's a true story, it was a suggestion of a, a woman who owned a bookstore in New York in my neighborhood, and she asked me, what was I going to write after Desert Queen, and she told me this story, but she had lived in Turkey for a while, and so I tried to, to write it as not as nonfiction, and I just could not get enough information. I had scholars in in Istanbul, go into the archives, and they couldn't get the, the Turks just didn't keep enough data about women. They mm -hmm. had tons of this material on the sultans and on the men and the Serraga, but not the women. Mm -hmm. And when I told my editor, she said, "Why don't you try it as a novel?" And so it it is the only novel that I've written. Um, it was fun to do, but it's also very, for me. I, I don't think I have the imagination. I need those facts. <laughs> you don't want to make it all up. I don't want to make it all up. Yeah. yeah. You, you mentioned the fact that a member of her family destroyed her diaries. And that theme comes up again and again in history. Uh, do, do you have any idea w what the motivation was for that? It was very personal. Um, this woman was her son's second wife. Uh, he had been married to a New York socialite. And started an affair with his secretary in Maryland, or I don't know where he was, maybe New York, but he left the first family, first wife and five, four or five children, and married the secretary, and lived in Baltimore, where his family was important. She was eager to climb the social ladder and never could. She was not accepted by Baltimore society. Mm -hmm. And she was very resentful of Marguerite. Mm -hmm. She wanted her jewels, she wanted her whatever, social status, mm -hmm. all of that. Mm -hmm. And they did not get along at all. And so when Marguerite died, mm -hmm. she burned her rubbish. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Did middle, uh, military intelligence have to review the book before publication? No, or no because it's all been declassified. <laughs> but some of it prior was classified. Oh, it was all classified. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, these were top secret and they were stamped. Yeah, it was secret. And, and interesting, they were, they were stamped. Some of them were stamped positive intelligence, mm -hmm. which means reporting on what was happening, whatever it was. They were turning the book or whatever. And some of it was stamped negative, meaning counterintelligence, meaning reporting on people who were trying to infiltrate the United States. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. I say one more question. One more question. We have time. Yeah. Perfect. Oh, well, that was perfect timing.